<clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching this. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to sing a hymn and give a little background on a hymn. Um, and I have this wonderful book I've borrowed. It's called Then Sings My Soul. It is 150 of the world's greatest hymn stories. I love stories behind the music and inspirations for things. And this tells about a lot of um, what, how some of the hymns we love came about. Um, so I chose one to start out with that was written in 1912, and I know that it's a favorite of many people. Um, and it was written by a gentleman named C. Austin Miles and the name of it is in the garden and there is a scripture reading at the beginning of the story of mr miles and his wonderful hymn it says from john 20 verse 14 she turned around and saw jesus standing there so the story behind in the garden the art of meditating on scripture involves using one's own imagination. Instead of simply reading a passage, we must read it, close our eyes, and visualize the scene, perhaps even putting ourselves in the picture. That's what the author of this hymn did. C. Austin Miles was a pharmacist who began writing gospel songs and eventually became an editor of hymnals and songbooks, as well as a popular music director at camp meetings, conventions, and churches. His hobby was photography, and he found his darkroom perfect for developing not just his photographs, but his devotional life. In the privacy and strange blue glow, Miles could read his Bible in total privacy. One day in March 1912, while waiting for some film to develop, he opened the Bible to his favorite chapter, John 20, the story of the first Easter. Miles later said, as I read it that day, I seemed to be part of the scene. My hands were resting on the Bible while I stared at the light blue wall. As the light faded, I seemed to be standing at the entrance of a garden, looking down a gently winding path shaded by olive branches. A woman in white with head bowed, hand clasping her throat as if to choke back her sobs, walked slowly into the shadows. It was Mary. As she came to the tomb upon which she placed her hand, she bent over to look in and hurried away. John in flowing robe look, appeared looking at the tomb and then came Peter who entered the tomb followed slowly by John. As they departed, Mary reappeared, leaning her head upon her arm at the tomb. She wept. Turning herself, she saw Jesus standing. So did I. I knew it was he. She knelt before him with arms outstretched and looking into his face cried, Rabboni. I awakened in full light, gripping my Bible with muscles tense and nerves vibrating. Under the inspiration of this vision, I wrote as quickly as the words would be formed, the poem exactly as it has since appeared. The same evening, I wrote the music. And here is In the Garden by C. Austin Miles. So sweet, the birds hush their sea. 
Campbell. I'm the pastor here, and we are so grateful that you are worshiping with us online uh, as we continue to worship through the gift of technology. Brothers and sisters, as we worship today, we give thanks that this is indeed the day that the Lord has made, and that we are all invited to rejoice and be glad in it. As we begin our worship this morning, I invite you to pause, to set aside whatever it is that's going on in your life, and to just center yourself as you come before God with an open heart and an open mind and an open spirit to praise and worship our living God this morning.
tonight, brothers and sisters, we do indeed lo love our Lord with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength, and we are indeed grateful to gather together and hear the ways that we are experiencing God's love and feeling God's love in our day-to-day -day living. This morning, I would invite you and encourage you to type into the comment section any Touch by God moments that you have, any moments in your day-to-day -day life where you have experienced the presence of God in a real way. Uh, this morning, Maria is going to share a Touch by God moment with us. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Just some really fun and exciting things that have been going on. Um, for the past couple of weeks, right, please, we've been visiting choir members, and uh, one at a time, having them videotape a, part, a, a beautiful song which that Denise is putting together. It's the Hymn of Promise. So um, to put together a virtual choir. But how it's so good, it's been so much fun to just reconnect with everybody and see everybody and and, and, and just chat about how life is and um, uh, how much we really are still very connected to each other. You know, in, in, in the midst of all this social distancing, it's so wonderful. What a heartfelt, wonderful thing to reconnect with everybody and um, and to know that there's so much. That's still going on. There's, you know, church is very much alive. Church is very much open. Um, and even for my second touch by God is that we're getting ready for celebrating the best of VBS for next Sunday. You're going to see old footage um, of VBS past. So the fun part of that has been visiting with people and reminiscing about Vacation Bible School from, you know, like 28 years ago. And um, having people go down memory lane and remember when they what they did with crafts, and how many kids were in the building, and who all was here, and who shared together, and those relationships that go back so long, and they're so deep, and when you reconnect with people, and you just remember just how much you, time you spent together in this place, you know, that we call home, and it's, it's the church body of Christ, and we are so very much connected, and it's just been such a touch by God, for me to experience the choir members and the VBS memories. And um, I just am so grateful to be part of this church family. And I just, uh, it, it just warmed my heart this whole week. So thank you. And stay tuned for next week because Vacation Bible School Best of Service is coming. It's going to be great. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I was also touched by God. Um, we've been collecting over the last couple of weeks some healthy snack donations and some swimsuits for some um, kids in our community who are lower income and are attending some summer camps so that both their parents can go to work. And so I was able to take those donations to the camp in Wall and I was so touched by God at um, how deeply appreciative they were and how, uh, once again, how generous this congregation is. So thank you so much for those donations and so blessed and touched by God to go and to uh, represent Hamilton in sharing the love of God in a real and tangible way. So thank you so very much. Uh, this morning as we move into um, thinking about all of the ways that we have been touched by God, we remember that all the time, that God is good all the time, and that all the time, God is good. Amen. This morning I wanted to share with our young disciples a little book that I have. It's called Rabbit Helps Out, and I hope you can see it. I'm going to try to hold it so you can see it. It's about Rabbit Helps Out, and it takes place in the wintertime, which is very nice for me to think about because it is super hot outside right now, and I enjoyed thinking about uh, the cooler weather. The story goes like this. Rabbit peeped out of his burrow. It was snowing hard. Oh, dear, he said. Breakfast will be hard to find this morning. And that reminds us of Psalm 145, which says, Watch over me, dear Jesus. Protect me from the storm. Provide for me, your little one, and keep me safe and warm. Rabbit was just trying to eat a frozen dandelion leaf when he met his friend Squirrel. Squirrel was searching for her store of acorns. Let me help you look for them, said Rabbit. Lord, teach me to be helpful and as kind as I can be. Help me to think of others before I think of me. 
And that's an interpretation from Matthew 25. I buried the acorns beneath a hawthorn tree that was full of red berries, said Squirrel. But the trouble is, all the trees look the same in the snow. And from Psalm 145 again, The one who made the heavens and formed the earth below has drawn a crystal pattern in each tiny flake of snow. Just then, a flock of starlings swooped down onto one of the trees, showering them in snow. Bother those starlings, said Rabbit. Now I've got snow all down my neck. Dear Lord, let me see the funny side when others get me down. Turn my tears to laughter and wipe away my frown. Again from Psalm 145. The starlings had shaken all the snow from the tree, and underneath it, it was full of red berries. Hooray, cried Squirrel. This is the tree where my acorns are buried. Whenever I am in trouble and do not know what to do, I pray that you will help me, Lord, for all goodness comes from you. Rabbit helped Squirrel clear away the snow, and there, just under the earth, were the acorns. Squirrel gave some to Rabbit for his breakfast. Thank you for helping, she said. When I give help to others, Lord, and serve as you would do, help me to remember I am really serving you. And this morning we remember that it is important in our faith to help and serve our friends, our neighbors, to help and serve everyone that we meet. Because when we do that, we are helping and serving Jesus. And we are showing the love of Jesus to those that we meet. Brothers and sisters, my young disciples, I miss you and love you. I cannot wait to see you. Make sure you join us next week for Vacation Bible School Sunday. And uh, keep, keep staying strong and know that God loves you very much. Let's say a prayer, and then we'll go into passing the peace. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we give you thanks for the reminder that we are called to help people in your name. Help us, oh God, to see those who need our help, and to remember that it's okay when we need help to ask for it and let others help us also. We pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts and our minds and our souls to love you and our neighbors more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we uh, share signs of peace and love, let us also sing together the powerful song, Jesu, Jesu. And while we're singing, let's text one another and share those beautiful signs of peace and love with one another.
our love and serve our neighbors is by holding one another in prayer in our times of need. So this morning, I would invite you and encourage you to type into the comment section any prayers that you bring with you this morning. Prayers of celebration and joy, prayers of heartache and pain. Let us turn it all over and lay it down at the foot of the cross as we carry our burdens to Christ and we hold one another in love and in prayer. Join me now, if you would, in our prayer song and let us turn to God as we pray. sing together. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. 
and not cross the road from human need. Give us a deep love for you, that we might see your love at work in this world, and that we might go and do likewise, all in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite you now to watch a video introducing our scripture this morning, and then to hear God's word for you after that. For the next 10 miles, proceed with caution. The road to Jericho is very steep and has dangerous curves. Hey Siri, would you check what the weather is today in Jericho? Sure. The current weather in Jericho is sunny and 102 degrees. Caution is strongly advised if you will be outside for extended periods of time. Hey Siri, play some music for me. Playing Elvis Presley. In one mile, prepare to pull over to help a traveler in need of assistance. Are you kidding me? Like I'm really going to stop for a stranger. Who do you think you are? This is Jesus. You've heard of my work, haven't you? Yeah. In one mile, the Jewish traveler is on your right. You know what those people believe in? Oh yeah, of course you do. Well, I'm not stopping for one of them. Lou, stop clowning around. You should be grateful I don't send you to pick up a leper and take him to a leper colony. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Hey, listen. What do you call a leper in prison? A leprechaun. Good one. Did you know I also created a cure for leprosy? Unfortunately, it costs an arm and a leg. <laughs> Money. In 500 feet, prepare to bandage the damaged Jew and then drive him to the Holiday Inn Express in Neptune and pay for him to stay there for a week. Really, girl? Luke, chapter 10 verse 25 to 37 the parable of the good samaritan just then a lawyer stood up to test jesus teacher he said what must i do to inherit eternal life he said to him what is written in the law what do you read there he answered you shall love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself and he said to him, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. 
Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Brothers and sisters, a congregation in our annual conference wanted to love their neighbor by collecting boxes of food for a lower income community in their town. For weeks, they collected all of the fixings, turkeys, mashed potatoes, vegetables, and pies, you name it, they were putting them together into these beautiful boxes created with love. And they were so excited to hand out the boxes to individual families the week of Thanksgiving. The week finally came and the families were indeed grateful for the donations. And through broken English, they were very thankful to the congregation and all of the volunteers. However, after Thanksgiving had passed, the congregation started to get to know these families who had received the food on a more personal level. In developing the relationships with these families, they discovered that the food donations were not exactly what the families were able to use. Many of these lower income families did not have ovens that were big enough to cook the turkeys. And they learned that in their culture, big holiday celebrations are often centered around a different meal of chicken and rice. In getting to know who their neighbor was, the congregation realized that they did not really know what they thought they knew. They realigned their mission with the needs of their neighbors. And now the two communities are growing closer and closer together. When the pastor of this congregation shared this story with me at the beginning of the week, it really got me thinking about the question that the lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? The lawyer could have asked so many other questions to Jesus. He could have asked so many other questions about the two commandments Jesus is quoting to love God and love our neighbor. He could have said, what do I need to do to be a better neighbor? And that question could have come back with some specific suggestions that would be easy to follow. The lawyer could have asked, and what do I need to do to love God more deeply? Again, this question would have resulted in some very tangible doable answers that we could just check off and know that we were doing what we must do to inherit eternal life. Instead, the lawyer asks a powerful question that opens the door, not to a to-do list, but to an entire way of being and seeing and existing in the world. Who is my neighbor? I know the traditional sermon on this scripture reminds us that we should all be the neighbor like the Good Samaritan and help those who are in need. But this morning, I would invite us to put ourselves into the other characters of this famous parable. Perhaps we are the man who has been going down the road to Jericho and we have been robbed or beaten. Perhaps our circumstances have us lying on the side of the road, hoping that someone will stop, notice, and help us. Perhaps we are the ones who are without a job, have been diagnosed with COVID or some other illness. Perhaps we are in financial stress or emotional turmoil. Perhaps it is our marriage that is strained, or we're trying to frantically figure out what will happen to our children with schooling in a few short weeks. Perhaps we're struggling under new demands in the workplace. Is this man on the side of the road not also a neighbor in the story? A neighbor to be redeemed and restored? A neighbor to be brought to wellness and worthy of love? And perhaps in the story, we are the person we don't want to be. Perhaps we are indeed the priest or the Levite who sees the man, but then chooses to pass by the other side of the road. Perhaps we are the ones who want to turn a blind eye to those who are in need and look the other way to the issues of our time. 
Perhaps we feel it is more than we can bear, more than we can take on, more than we can stomach. And so from a place of privilege, we choose to ignore the problems of our day and pass by, instead, of, instead focusing on our normal routines and agendas. Perhaps we are tired of hearing about the political turmoil, the racial tensions, the environmental concerns, or the plight of the poor. Perhaps we just want to be happy. Perhaps we have all that we can handle, and we want to let the problems be dealt with by someone who is more qualified anyway. And is the priest and the Levite in this story not also our neighbor? Isn't the priest and the Levi, Levite also worthy of our love and patience, understanding and care? Isn't the priest and the Levite also seen by Christ, loved by God, and valued even when they take the easier path? Now obviously we are meant to emulate the Good Samaritan. Obviously Jesus is teaching us that we should stop and see and care for and pour out love on those who are hurting. But the parable is, I believe, good news for everyone because it is a reminder that God has got an eye on us even when we screw up, even when we make the wrong decision, even when we fail to be the good Samaritan. And so as we continue on this road of our lives, I encourage you to be gentle with yourselves, to reach for the goal of being the Good Samaritan, and then offering yourselves and others grace and forgiveness when you pass by. When I was in seminary, I heard a story about research done by Darley and Batson in Princeton in 1973. A group of theology students at my alma mater were told that they would go across campus and deliver a sermon on the topic of the Good Samaritan. As part of the research, some of these students were told that they were late and that they needed to hurry up. Along their route across campus, Darley and Batson had hired an actor to play the role of a victim who was coughing and suffering. 90% of the late students in Princeton Theological Seminary ignored the needs of the suffering person in their haste to get across campus. As the study reports, and I quote, indeed on several occasions, a seminary student going to give his talk on the parable of the Good Samaritan literally stepped over the victim as he hurried away, end quote. Now, when I first heard this research story, I was appalled that seminary students could just pass by someone when literally on their way to preach the Good Samaritan's passage. As I reflect on this scripture and I think about this research, I can't help but ask, when these seminary students were being the priest and the Levite, when they passed by the one in need, did God love them less? Did they not live as the Good Samaritan in other times and circumstances? Were there almost 30 years of ministry negated because of the one mistake they made? I certainly think not and hope not and pray not. Now before anyone goes around saying that the pastor said we don't need to extend kindness and compassion anymore, let me be very clear here. We are called and challenged to be the Good Samaritan. We are called to help, to be the hands and feet of Christ to those who are hurting. I'm just inviting us into a new way of wrestling with this scripture and opening our minds as to who we offer kindness and compassion to. Because when I read this again with fresh eyes, I realize that the priest and the Levite and too often ourselves need grace and forgiveness as well. Who is our neighbor, the lawyer asks. I think Jesus lifts up this prime example of the Samaritan helper, but somewhere in the parable, Jesus is reminding us all, the whole messy lot of us, 
that we are neighbors to one another. When one of us messes up, another one might need to step in. When one of us is beaten down, one of us needs to provide care. There are times where we need help, and there are times where we can provide the help. There are times where we are doing the very best that we can, and that is all we can offer in the moment. And this whole messy lot of circumstances is all together in the kingdom of God. We need each other, and we need to continue opening our hearts and our minds up to the neighbor with grace and with love. We need to really get to know one another, our stories, our wants, and our needs. And then as we live in that beloved kingdom where the love of God and neighbor rules above all else, surely then we will inherit the kingdom of God and know eternal life. May it be so. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite us now to imagine that kingdom of God, the people of God, coming together and living love as we have been taught. Let's sing together. Benediction written by Reverend Heather Moody. 
Brothers and sisters, go forth from this worship service refreshed and empowered to do the ministry which God has called you to do. Travel lightly, for you carry within you all that you need. Notice God's presence in simple, everyday experiences. And whenever the opportunity arises, remember to labor for the good of all. And may the blessing and joy of our God, our creator, healer, and life giver, go with you today and always. Amen. As we go into our week, I would encourage you and invite you to join in any of the events happening in the life of our church. We have our Tuesday night Bible study that is meeting in Neptune City. This week there is no Wednesday night Bible study, but Thursday night we will have our second outdoor praise night. We invite you to come with masks and a chair. We will remain socially distant. Remember that our building is closed and that does mean um, bathroom facilities, but we would love to have you come and join us for about a half an hour of praise music and prayer. And if you have any song suggestions or anything that's been really meaningful to you through this time and you would love to sing, please let Maria know and we will get them um, included into, if not this week, a future praise night service. And we will be back next Sunday morning with worship and coffee hour. If you'd like to join us for coffee hour, we'll be on in a few minutes via Zoom. All right, God bless and go in God's grace and peace. Brothers and sisters, we invite you to share now your tithes and your offerings to God and to the work of God's people. 